Well, here it is, 7 p.m., and welcome to the Transcendentalism Council. Uh, we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Sarah Ann Wider to speak today about Carolyn Sturgis Tapton and the questioner's art. Uh, but first, let me um, just uh, announce our next event, which will be historian Richard Smith speaking on Thomas Wentworth Higginson. And uh, that will be Monday, December 5th, a live event in person at First Parish and also on Zoom. So you can register at the link in the chat. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker and then uh, please be thinking of some questions that uh, we can uh, address to her after her talk. She'll talk for about 40 minutes. And you can put those questions in the chat. Okay, so Dr. Sarah Ann Wider is a Professor Emerita of English and Women's Studies at Colgate University. Her specialties are the American Renaissance, late 19th and early 20th century American women writers, and Native American literature. Her books include The Critical Reception of Emerson, Unsettling All Things. All right, thank you very much. And today she'll speak about Caroline Sturgis Tappan and the Questioner's Art. Well, it's wonderful to be here in this Zoom room as we have some gotten accustomed to doing over these past few years. Um, and I also wanted to begin by remembering someone who left us much, at least for so many of us, too soon. Um, Joel Meyerson, who passed away now almost a year ago, and I think about the support that he gave me all the years of, of my work and, you know, still would be sending me things about Caroline Sturgis that he'd come across in Emerson's account books, and just how grateful I am for the support that he gave to all of us scholars um, and how much he has missed. And so I think I also wanted to have this talk be in some ways in his honor um, and continuation of the work that he has started so many of us on. Um, and again, you know, it is wonderful to share this work. Um, I went back and forth about what to share and decided to try to put it a little bit more heavily on Sturgis's drawings. She was somebody who worked in a lot of different forms, as you'll hear tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and start my screen share so that you can actually um, we'll get to one of her pieces pretty quickly. Um, and let's see. Uh oh, I don't know. I, I may have to ask. Oh, no, here it is. Here it is. Just um, and I hope that is the it is is that now showing for everybody. I just need to start this. The, the, um... uh, no, it's not shown. Oh, there okay. it is. Okay. Yes, there it is. And now we'll just get this. Should. Oops, I'm sorry. I've just gotten the wrong one up. This is a little bit um, embarrassing. I thought that I had the right one. Can you go it? Well, let's just see. Let me get that back again. Um, it is strangely has disappeared from my. Here, you uh, want me to? I'll get yours. Uh, get mine. That would be perfect. That would just be perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Technical glitches. You never know when they're going to come strike you. We did this perfect in, uh, you know, are trying it out, and then all of a sudden there it was gone. Um, but in an evening that centers questions, I begin by asking, what questions did you arrive with tonight? Perhaps the name Caroline Sturgis is a question in itself. Sturgis, you ask, with multiple question marks after her name. What should I know about her? But that's no small question, and in turn raises many more about how it might be answered. Perhaps you know her relatively well, although I ask, does anyone? What aspects, you must be wondering, will I focus on tonight? Maybe you are familiar with Sturgis because you have focused on Margaret Fuller's life and writings or because she's come up in the Emerson biography, or perhaps even in relation to Henry James Sr.'s world, or then again in connection with his son, William James's spiritualism. At the same time, we all come with so many questions. 
I like to think the human beings are questions embodied. What questions are you carrying with you today, whether, as my students like to say, your questions are on topic or not? Maybe the questions you carry are not even your own, yet you are carrying them all the same. Which raises another question, why? Why do we carry the questions we do? And doesn't it often feel like that? Questions have weight, heft, and we tote them, carry them, sometimes gently, sometimes grudgingly, sometimes wondering at how heavy they are. And yet as humans, we are certainly made to carry questions, to take them wherever we go. I certainly arrive with many questions, several of which I will share with you this evening. And to do this, I bring you a questioner par excellence, Caroline Sturgis Tappan. Uh, here she is, first, as you'll see in this self-portrait, and it comes from the poetry book that she created around 1840. And then here, if you can advance um, for me, um, a daguerreotype that is from 1848. Um, to Emerson, she wrote in 1841, a hundred questions importune me, which it would require many lives to answer. Reading Sturgis's writings and looking at her visual art reveals a range of study and questioning that aligns her with her contemporaries within transcendentalism and undoubtedly argues for her importance within that group of writers, artists, educators, and reformers. She considers both the ontological and ethical dimensions, raising questions about the source of human identity, about the necessity and extent of human vocation, and about the perpetual flux that constituted the world's existence. These are the questions Emerson called the whence and whither questions, questions that appear variously throughout his work, as well as throughout his fellow transcendentalists. They form the basis, for example, of Frederick Henry Hedge's poem, Questionings, published in the third issue of The Dial. They are the unanswered questions posed in the dream with which Walden's The Pond in Winter chapter opens. And they are the questions Thoreau addresses throughout Walden, both with direct answer, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, and with further question, why should we live with such hurry and waste of life? In Sturgis's work, visual and verbal, such questions are transformative, or rather they can be if one considers them. They have not always been considered, Earlier moments in the scholarship consigned Sturgis to the clever flirt, or the Bettina to Emerson's Goethe. Kathy Lawrence, who is one of the few people to have worked specifically on Sturgis, eviscerates these default narratives in her excellent discussions of why it has been so difficult to get to Sturgis herself. I can share a painful memory from a graduate school seminar where a professor, with great glee and gusto, used Sturgis's poem greatly to be as the target of his biting satire to show just how minor was the poetry of the so-called minor transcendentalists. In a way, he was doing more, no more than had Christopher Peirce Cranch, who caricatured the lines, as you will see here in the next slide. And if you can advance, thank you. With the rotund transcendentalists, all male, declaiming to that poor shivering figure in the center. Neither Cranch nor the professor stopped to query the life story behind Sturgis's poem. Sturgis's periods of what we would now call depression as she struggled with being a woman in the 19th century, a person who longed for purposeful work, for a vocation, but found she had little access to meaningful action. She had written to Fuller in the summer of 1841, oh, Margaret, how hard it is to resume life when there is nothing to resume. She wrote to Emerson about this search for a life purpose, a life work that would both ground her being and open her agency for real effect. The poem, Greatly to Be, which Cranch caricatured, comes out of that struggle. Keenly aware of the constraints faced by white women of her class, she developed various strategies for maintaining intellectual integrity. Questioning was key among them, and she honed that tool across all the genres in which she worked. 
so as not to keep you staring at the Cranch caricature and to introduce you to Sturgis's sketching and to the poetry books she created. Here is the opening page of her Bluebell Butterfly book from 1840. And if we can move on to the next slide. I have been reading and considering and thinking about Sturgis's work for nearly 20 years. Conclusions do not come readily to me. And certainly conclusiveness and definitiveness about Sturgis is difficult for several reasons. First, there are practical problems. Her papers, though not insubstantial, are filled with missing pieces. And yes, I recognize the oxymoron. How can an absence be filled with what is missing? How can missing pieces fill something? And yet that is what the manuscript record divided among the Houghton Library at Harvard, the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, and the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College feels like. The manuscript record is not insubstantial, but so much isn't there. Sturgis and Ellery Channing were in a close relationship, whatever we choose to call that connection, but almost none of the letters between them survive. She and Fuller were also in a close and often vexed relationship, and there too, whole years of her side of the correspondence are gone. Presumably there was correspondence with other close friends like Jane Tuckerman, though none have been located. There are many letters to her mother and sisters, and yet again, those seem haphazard, especially when compared to the extent of her other sister's correspondence. Even the correspondence with Emerson, which is the most complete, shows major gaps, missing or incomplete letters precisely in the middle of a really interesting discussion. And then when you look at the collections themselves, especially those in the Sophia Smith collection, one wonders how her papers were kept both during and after her life. As Ron Bosco and I will attest, as we have worked slowly on her letters, there is a bit of disorder. Scraps of paper with sketches, her few sketchbooks, some started with one purpose and ended to another, poetry books, poetry notebooks, poems by others that she copied out, a miscellaneous journal, lists kept from organizing social occasions, poetry fascicles, similar to what we know from Emily Dickinson. When I look at all of those pieces of paper, I see tremendous creative energy leading in many directions, raising many questions, answering none. In her writings, you find a revealing through line, her interest in the unfinished, her distrust of the definitive. While many of us have been accustomed to think of sketches as what is done before the real work, I have increasingly come to think about Sturgis as someone for whom the sketch was the primary foundational form. It best expressed a world perpetually in flux. What she saw as the constitutive state of the universe and hoped to see applied more creatively to human societies. Sturgis practiced what I am calling the questioner's art. And let me tell you, did she ever know how to deploy a question? As long as we have records for and about her, back to her childhood and through her late adulthood, you see that she asked questions of herself, of others, of social structures, of God or the gods. Emerson described her as the insatiate maiden who opened enormous claims against the gods. She called herself a questioner and found that this defining element of self split her off from the prevailing gender roles of the day. Writing to Emerson in 1840, and if you can advance to the next slide, she remarked, it is difficult, oops, can we go back just one more? Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. It is difficult for me to feel myself as a woman, I am such a questioner, and feel myself so much more as a soul. And I figured it was rather nice to like overlay that quotation on this opening page of her Blue Belt Butterfly book. And I'm, again, maybe we can talk about this in Q&A, but fascinated with what's going on gender definition wise for these folks in the 19th century, um, obviously long before they were using the terms that we would use now. But the fact that she would think of herself as questioner and how that might then delimit how she would think of herself in other ways. Now for some of those 
bo bare bone facts of her life. She was born in 1819, which makes her not quite a generation younger than Emerson or Fuller, but younger enough from both of them so that she was treated differently in their world. She was also born in a family that was far different than the Emersons. No long line of ministerial legacy there. Her father made a fortune in the China trade, also in the Northwest trade. And yes, that fortune would have included dealing in opium. Her name was part of that legacy. She was named for one of the ships William Sturgis had sailed on. At the time of her birth in 1819, she entered a household of an older brother, William, and two older sisters, Ellen and Annie. Not long after her birth, another two sisters were born, Mary and Sue. Brother William made all the difference in the world. Unfortunately, that difference turned on his unexpected death in a freak boating accident while he was still a student at Harvard. Sturgis was nearly eight at the time. The family never recovered, though of course that tells us little. Death changes families irrevocably, and the Sturgises were no exception. It certainly broke the marriage, and Elizabeth and William Sturgis took to living separately. After her son's death, Elizabeth Sturgis has been represented as entering a depression that never listed, lifted. In no way do I want to minimize that grief. And yet I've also discovered other reasons for why Elizabeth Sturgis's, Caroline's mother, why that her life never settled into something more harmonious. She was not treated kindly, at least by one of her daughters, in this case, Ellen, when it came to her involvement in protests against the infamous Indian Removal Act. In a letter to Caroline, Ellen makes fun of their mother's determination to be involved in the resistance. One wishes that Elizabeth Sturgis had lived closer to Concord and could have been able to be befriended by Mary Merrick Brooks. We have nothing written by Sturgis during her childhood years, although miniature newspapers made by her brother were carefully preserved, as were some of his school papers. There are letters sent by Ellen to her mother when she and Annie were still in dame school. Unfortunately, nothing survives from the Emerson Brothers School in Roxbury. By the time Caroline was old enough, that school had closed, much to Waldo Emerson's relief, the brothers taken in different directions. Sturgis is reputed to have attended one of Alcott's schools, though by the time the Temple School opened, she would have been on the old side to have been a student at that most innovative of educational establishments. She was under the tutelage of another famous educator, Dorothea Dix, and was expelled from that school. The precise reasons are unknown, but can perhaps be gleaned from the praise Emerson accorded Sturgis in a journal entry from early December of 1837. And if you could advance the slide. There he heralded the fair girl expressing so decided and proud choice of influences, so careless of pleasing, so willful, and with so lofty a will. Certainly willfulness might have put her at cross purposes in Dix's school. Emerson's entry not only celebrates the power of will for the individual herself, but extends that power beyond the individual. Such power of will communicates. It takes effect in, for, and with others. And again, we can, we can go forward to the next slide, you'll see the whole entry in context. The entry continues, that will inspires the wish to come nearer to and speak to this nobleness. So shall we be ennobled also. I wish to say to her, never strike sail to any. Come into port greatly or sail with God the seas. Not in vain you live, for the passing stranger is cheered, refined, and raised by the vision. That passage from Emerson's journal with revisions would appear the next month in his January 1838 lecture titled Heroism as well as in the 1841 essay of the same title. Emerson had observed Sturgis at social gatherings at the Sturgis family home, where even earlier than the comments that made their way into heroism, he noted how she could sketch with invention, a quality in which he saw far more promise than in those who dutifully learned the rules by following their teacher's lessons. In his entry, he identified technical skill with self-distrust, 
an invention with those who launch away into the deep, a quality he saw in Sturgis's sketches. For Sturgis, the metaphor would prove apt. She who loved all bodies of water as well as being on water, a person who was often inclined to launch away into some depths, metaphoric or otherwise, Sturgis never seemed particularly interested or willing to follow others' directions. Flummoxing Fuller at different points when Fuller had created plans only to find Sturgis pulling back from them. Sturgis certainly was never in one place for long. And during her early adulthood, a mere glance at the number of places she resided gives an excellent sense of how peripatetic her life was. While she attended Fuller's conversations with regularity and attempted the same for Emerson's lectures, she was famous for departing suddenly when she was a guest in someone's house. I consider Sturgis's perpetual motion to be strategic on her part, an excellent course of action for a young woman who wanted, to borrow Thoreau's phrase, as far as possible to live free and uncommitted. Of course, it helped that Sturgis's father was wealthy and would subsidize where she lived. Financial privilege, however, could only postpone the narrative that was almost inescapable for a woman of her race and class. The marriage plot finally got her, and she married William Aspinwall Tappan in 1847. Many of us have spent a good bit of time speculating on why even she fell prey to that plot. That's our way of seeing it. We just don't know what she thought approaching the marriage because there are no extant letters from that period. Her letters shortly after the marriage, when she and William were first in New York City, give little indication that these two people would not be able to live well till death did them part. I know a goodly number of folks, some here tonight, feel that Waldo pretty much arranged the marriage, making it possible to keep both Caroline and William safely in his circle. William was one of the promising young men that so interested Emerson. Caroline was an intellectual intimate and some have wondered much more about the intimacy that she and Emerson shared, though I remain uncertain. Given our post-Freudian, post-so-called sexual revolution sensibilities, I often question how well equipped we are to understand the complexities of relations possible within their time, possibilities that may well be closed to us. Caroline referred to William Tappan as the great unknown. She may have appreciated how laconic he was. One difficulty she found with Waldo Emerson and appreciated about Elizabeth Hoare was their different tolerations of silence. With Elizabeth, she could sit together in silence. Waldo apparently was not comfortable with that. How long Sturgis and Tappan's marriage remained tenable is hard to say. Two children were born, the first named Ellen after Sturgis's recently dead sister, at the time, she and William were living on the Hudson, not far from where Sturgis and Fuller had spent a productive few months during the fall of 1844, Fuller revising the great lawsuit into woman in the 19th century, Sturgis reading various books about different mythologies and presumably working on the children's stories that would be published in 1847. The Tappan's second daughter, Mary, was born after they moved to Lenox. Living at first at Sam and Anna Ward's homes while their own could be built. Sturgis and Tappan went to Europe with their daughters for half a decade in the mid 1850s. And the few letters from Sturgis to Emerson during this period reference how she and William read Emerson's poems together, seeing where the book would fall open and reading from there. The location they chose was the Tusculum, where Cicero had written his Tusculan Disputations, also known as the Tusculan Questions. Shortly after they returned to the United States, war was declared, not theirs, but the United States. Sturgis sent one of William's essays to Emerson, hoping he might forward, if not its publication, at least its widespread circulation as a way of bringing the war to a close. The essay no longer exists, probably destroyed William's favorite home, the famed Little Red House in Lenox, known mostly to us for its connection with the Hawthorns, burned to the ground. But apparently Emerson did not find it particularly compelling, certainly not original. He responded with bland praise that William had written it was enough, he told her. 
As I conclude this elusively brief description of Sturgis's life, here are a few more salient aspects. As did Fuller, Sturgis loved music and all her life sought out concerts and musicians. While Sturgis was living in Lenox in the 1850s, Emerson's daughter Ellen attended the famed Sedgwick School and Sturgis happily took Ellen under her wing, teaching her to paddle her own canoe. Ellen reported this to her father. That period, however, left Sturgis with less time than she had hoped for spending days with Ellen. In June of 1853, Sturgis's sister Sue committed suicide. And that is a whole other lecture for a whole other night about the devastating consequences of a society's enforcement of gender roles at the expense of human beings. In letters to Sister Ellen, Sue questioned the immovable constraints imposed by society's closely surveilled performance of gender. She questioned the world that dictated one set of behavior for herself and another for her then closest companions. Sue also railed against the gods, or in this case, God, for making the mistake of making her female. After a summer chumming with her male friends, riding horseback, exploring the woods in endless and open days of active life, they went to Harvard. She stayed home, married well, as that phrase goes, and ended her life a few apparently painful years later. Sturgis had addressed Sister Sue as Job, the person raising complaints against God. For those of us who know Sarah Ahmed's work, we may well think of Sue Sturgis Bigelow writing in that form of the feminist complaint. Sturgis too contributed to that form in poems written after her marriage about birds in cages and eviscerating the double standard in education in an unpublished children's story. There was certainly less poetry written after her marriage, although she did publish a second children's book in the mid 1850s. She also had the good fortune of continuing financial support from her father even after his death. She collected art, amassing an amazing group of photographs, a form that always interested her through all of its emergent technologies, even to the possibilities of using daguerreotype for landscape. She worked for suffrage and happily, for those of us in the 21st century, she parted company with the most racist arm of the suffrage movement. At the same time, her argument for suffrage makes one sigh. It centered women's right to own property, real estate. And certainly that was a self-interested comment coming from a propertied woman. Then again, I would like to give her the benefit of the doubt and say that she was being strategic, arguing in the terms that those in power would understand. Where I cannot give her the benefit of the doubt is with her comments about those from native communities. Those remarks are reprehensible, as was her conviction that she and Emerson would have made better Indians, her use, of course, than those who were born into those communities. Sturgis questioned so much, and yet in signal cases fell so far short of the questioning she celebrated. Sturgis's life and varied work during that life, although she might object and say that she did no real work in her life at all, and that was precisely the problem, raised far more questions than I can ever imagine being able to answer. One of the most intriguing ones raised both by Sturgis's life itself and in her writings and sketches in turn raises a question for us. Why or when do we think questions must be definitively answered? What are the pressures that demand a definitive and authoritative, dare I say authoritarian, answer? What prevents us from working within the provisional the responsive, the flexible. Even my above judgment of Sturgis's ethnocentrism may still be a hasty conclusion on my part, continuing the very problem it seeks to address. What happens when we take a different approach, leaving questions open, our so-called answers unfinished, provisional, uncertain, inconclusive? I take my cue from Sturgis, who practiced an aesthetic and perhaps even ethic of the unfinished. When you look at her visual art in particular, she seemed drawn, and yeah, that's a bad pun, to the sketch. And those sketches often were done with thorough pencils. She illustrated her letters, particularly those to her sisters, and delightfully so. 
here, and if we could advance finally to the next slide. Um, I don't know. Can we get can we get to that? Oh, there. Perfect. Um, you see a letter that Caroline wrote to Sister Ellen about her recent stay at Horn Pond in Woburn with all the sisters and their families. She has titled it an aquatic excursion. And you see this assemblage of women and men in their boats, one of the men on the far side of the screen puffing away on his cigar. As you might have noticed, only the women are rowing. You might wonder what is up with those two figures in the water, arms uplifted, looking unperturbed. Are they beneficent water sprites? Then you read Sturgis's description. Only two children lost overboard, best not to notice them. They vanish like chimera, leaving only a bubble behind. Hmm. Don't worry about the kids who fell overboard. Yeah, just leave them behind. All right, I called the illustration delightful, but the humor is also dark. The satire skirting on what is not humorous at all. All those things that fall under the heading best not to notice. So much comes to mind. Her illustrations done for particular moments, occasional and occasioned, were not always laden with satire. She reserved that kind of satire for correspondence with her sisters. When she was living or staying in Concord, she drew to amuse Ellen Emerson. There are a series of truly delightful sketches in the Smith collection. Here is one of my favorites, and if we can go on to the next slide. A young girl out fishing, and it's not a particularly good um, image that I have here, but I hope you can see. Um, if you look on the fishing line, she has been extraordinarily successful. She's got not one, but two fairies who are climbing up her fishing pole. I also love the sturdiness of Sturgis's children, especially in comparison with the fashion plate children of the ladies magazine of her day. And if we can go on to the next slide, um, you'll see the kind of stark contrast where those little girls do not look anywhere near as sturdy, nor could they obviously be outside fishing um, as readily. In the Smith collection, one of the images, and we can move on to the next one, is identified with the words, these pictures were made in Concord probably to please Ellen Emerson, who was inspired by them to draw in this style as nearly as possible. Although Ellen expressed frustration to her mother, discouraged by the seemingly insurmountable distance between what Sturgis drew and what she, Ellen, at age nine could render. Sturgis's drawings may also have arisen from another desire on Sturgis's part to give Lydian and Waldo visual memories of their daughter's childhood, something she had been unable to do for little Waldo, whose death was still recent. Some of you have read Emerson's letter to Sturgis written a few weeks after Waldo's death, begging Sturgis for any vibrant representations she could provide. He simply desperately wrote, and we can move on to the next slide. Oh, yes, if you have any pictures of this child in your memory, in your head, do not fail, I entreat you, to draw them all for me on paper. Certain nonetheless that his request would be impossible to fulfill. As you'll see, the letter continues. That you will not have, I sadly believe, the real refuses to be represented when it is taken to heart and a copy is heartily wanted. Some of the drawings Sturgis did may have been with that request still in mind. For example, in the next slide, you'll see, and we can move on. Yes, there it is. The caption reads, Edith Emerson, who loved to play with her father's cane. Sturgis also illustrated her poetry notebook. So in some cases, it looks less like deliberate illustration and more like the most convenient piece of paper on hand at the time to hold the idea of the moment. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. As you see at the bottom, those just look like, okay, here's the place I have. It's an open space. I'm just going to put these faces here right now. And there are so many heads, faces in profile or turn three quarters to us. And we can move through the next two very quickly just to give you these examples. Um, yeah, so there you've got heads. Next slide, more heads. Um, and that's part of a letter. 
Um, and then there are faces behind words. So on to the next slide. Um, and you can see the you know pretty well defined one head and then another head that's sort of peeking out behind um, some of those words there. And then on the next slide, you'll see something that was very characteristic her, of her. You just get a lot of faces in trees. And then on the next slide, you've got more faces looking away, looking up, looking at, looking beyond, and you could even go on to the next one. Um, and you just she was just fascinated with faces. Um, and in this one too, it's a little hard to see in this representation, but I almost wonder whether she's trying to draw some clouds there in the background. She also was just in love with clouds and wrote a lot about them. I, I'm not quite certain if I'm reading that image right. Many of the work still seemed to be in process under revision as if she might go back and add or change or alter what she had drawn. For the remainder of our time, I'm going to have us look just at two more of her sketches, and I look forward to the varieties of question they will generate among us. I turn first to one of her letter illustrations, in part for its humor, in part for what the accompanying language illustrates about the, if not seamless blend, at least determinedly woven blend of domestic demands within mental sustenance. Writing to Sister Ellen, Sturgis needs her overcoat and umbrella. Boots she has, and as she expresses it to Ellen, those three cronies, boots, overcoat, and umbrella, should never have been separated. She continues with an illustration, and, and we can move on to the next, and there the illustration is, let me show you a woman accoutred in all three, so panoplied, so blessed. She's got the umbrella, she's got the overcoat, she's got the India rubber shoes on. In this letter, she also requests a particular ribbon if Ellen can find the one that matches her dress, but that is not all. Along with these outer garments, she asks for the inner garments, a large supply of mental wear to meet and match any number of intellectual interests, ranging from science to literature to philology to reference. She requests what her mind currently craves, and that translates into a not insubstantial number of volumes. She writes, if you send or bring the cloak, put in with it an astronomy, Herschel's, a French and German dictionary, a Goethe, and Kreitzer's little book, if they are all or any in my room. She doesn't indicate which Goethe, but in all likelihood, it would have been the second volume of Faust, given Sturgis's fascination with the Helena section. Kreitzer's little volume is Significance of the Alphabet, only recently published by Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. Commenting on the capacious miscellany of her request for ribbons to outer garments to mental challenges in all genres, she notes how perplexed a later biographer would be. Then she adds the caveat, that biographer would be perplexed were she a man. She writes, now if I were Goethe, Dante, Frank Jackson, or any other great man, how it would puzzle my biographers. However, she turns limitation into freedom, continuing, but being um, only myself, peace to my ashes. The word ashes, however, starts her in a different direction. Where there are ashes, there has been fire. Where there has been fire, there is warmth. And there is one thing that she lacks, warmth, and that she's anticipating lacking for the next six months. It is all, after all, New England. Lamenting the cold descending upon New England, she writes to Ellen, let us seek a warmer clime and eat coconuts beneath a palm tree from the 1st of November to the 1st of May. To this, she adds a two-paneled illustration captioned, the pine tree dreameth of the palm. Uh, there's a backstory to that caption, which we can talk more about in the Q&A if you're interested. It's a bit curious, or maybe it's just a wildly funny quotation out of context. But here in any event, and we can move on to the next slide, is the left panel. And you see the pine tree with two figures, presumably Caroline and Ellen dreaming, or perhaps they're shivering. Um, you can see the one person who's lying on the ground with their arms kind of pulled up tight against her beneath that branches of the palm, of, of the pine tree, excuse me. And then there's the divider, which looks like it started life as a tree, but then was drawn over by the hatched rectangle. 
On the other side of the rectangle is warmth. And now we can go to the next slide. The palm tree, the desired coconuts, together with Carrie and Ellen. As you see, they are drawn as children, and a few more characters have joined them. In the tree, you see this fellow, call him what you will, uh, certainly helping those coconuts to shower down upon the sisters. The sister to the left is clearly oblivious to anything else that's going on, happily enjoying the coconut milk. And who knows exactly how she managed to so readily get into that hard nut to crack? The other sister seems quite oblivious as well, especially to that enormous snake behind her. The snake doesn't look particularly menacing, just large. And the way its eye is drawn suggests that it is the most attentive figure in the scene. Well, perhaps with the exception of the figure in the tree, or maybe that elephant? Yep, there's an, in the background, for good measure, is an elephant. With the question running up the side, ask Sue if this is true to nature. Sue's reply is not recorded. And if we can move on to the next slide, you'll be able to see the whole illustration as she drew it for Ellen. Um, and so you see, you know, the one panel where they're dreaming of the pine tree, dreameth of the palm. Um, and then, of course, the other side. This humorous rendering about impending winter, that horror of snow, as Sturgis called it, seems just that, a lovely whimsy, a bit of fun, and a bit of apology for not being able to pack what she needed when she traveled to Lennox in the first place. At the same time, worth acknowledging is the reality beneath the apparent fun. Sturgis's humor steps the sisters even farther away from the reality they may have known to be inevitable, perhaps even in 1846, that Ellen's tuberculosis would not be survivable. She needed warmer climes, but even those could not keep her alive. I also wish I had time to show you Sturgis's illustration about the character of Punch, a figure she told Ellen who so consumed her thoughts she could think of and indeed draw nothing else, but that has to be for another time. I'm gonna end with a drawing that Sandra Sturgis's particular fascination with human faces. As I mentioned earlier, faces are everywhere in her papers, sometimes seemingly impromptu, simply to capture something she saw or an expression she imagined. Known for this penchant among her friends, Emerson even decided to give her an assignment, figuring she was the one best suited to render character visually. In a journal entry from 1839, and we can move on to the next slide, he commented, a lady it seems has painted the auxiliary verbs, do, ought, might, cannot. I gave CS for a subject, the age, to be represented in a series of heads, conservatism, State Street, Christian Register, revolt, protest, fair perplexity, dyspepsia, Warren Chapel. Wouldn't we love to see those? I wish I could show them to you, but they too have gone missing. We don't know whether Sturgis finished this assignment and turned it into Emerson, whether she never quite finished that project, or whether they once existed and now are lost to us. Interestingly, there are two half sheets of Sturgis's sketches at the appropriate point in Emerson's journal near the entry I just quoted. However, those heads seem not to match Emerson's assignment. There are also heads sketched by Caroline that I could show you, but choose not to because they replicate the racist science of her day. And especially in ours, I see no good in amplifying that. She took drawing classes at different points in her life in New York City shortly after her marriage during her stays in Europe. The Smith collection assumes these heads come from that later period. They are unfortunately what you would expect, the ugly racist renderings of racial and ethnic types. What Sturgis thought to do with those instructions in racism, we do not know. Again, this is a moment where I wish she could have employed that independence of thought with which Emerson credited her in heroism. How I wish she had rejected supremacist representation and noted her rejection forthrightly in her writings and notebooks. But she did not. And I hope this is a question we might take up in the Q&A. How we continue to reckon with the flaws in these writers and artists. How we continue to work with the words and images they left behind 
in ways that do not replicate the inequities they fail to see or address. I will end with an image where Sturgis did bring her questioning power to bear. It appears in the Bluebell Butterfly book and speaks to the ecological collapse, a collapse our planet is now facing. Everywhere in Sturgis's poetry is identity with the non-human world in its most elemental forms, rivers, clouds, trees, oceans, the wind. She envisions an identity between her speakers and the elements of the world and literally renders this in her sketches, as you'll see here, and we can go on to the next slide, final slide. This sketch certainly raises questions about design and finish. How did she envision this drawing when she began? Did she begin with that side facing upward gazing individual who looks a bit in her rendering like a landform who then joins hands as it were with the tree? At the same time, it looks like there is some intent to cross out the figure as if that were a false start. Or is this just part of another tree? or a tree beginning to be drawn over a figure. And then there is the wonderful merger of person with tree, the dryad, if you will, a face that you might miss at first, but once seen in the trunk of that tree, continues to draw the eye, even as it recedes back into the tree. The profiled head looks out from the tree, off the page with an ever forward gaze, looking always to something the reader cannot see, inviting us back into the endless realm of question. And I will stop here and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That I, that last sketch is really uh, so captivating, really. Okay, let's see what questions we have here. Oh, we just have uh, some praise about how wonderful it is. <laughs> Carolina, do you have a question? I don't have a specific question, but I was thinking about her relationship with native culture, which we saw was very problematic. And I wanted to ask how to find resources about it because um, I don't seem to find many online. So if you know something that could be easily accessible because like that problematic part is very important for us to understand and know the limits of our admiration and and you know how we read them in the 21st century. So mm -hmm. thanks, it was amazing. When you mentioned sketches, I was thinking about mental sketches as well and not necessarily literal sketches, but she was quite an artist as well. Yeah, yeah. And as far as the, um, you know, her interactions, which would have been, very cursory as far as the, the actual people that she would have act interacted with people from the communities, you know, probably around the haunt and um, that probably would have bought some baskets from them. Um, she didn't understand, um, how do I say, um, she really judged by appearances, which also was very surprising to me because you know, she she somehow expected them to look like, I suppose, somehow a kind of romanticized vision of an Indian that, that people should be dressing like they, like these painters, the Western, you know, like a Western landscape painter might have plunked Indians from, you know, even centuries before. And so I think she had very little experience actually meeting people. Um, and that was probably precisely also the problem or only in a capacity where she was the buyer and they were selling to her. Um, there's been some good work, I think, especially from some of the native scholars um, that goes also back and think about, oh, I think it's at the Concord Museum tomorrow night, right? At the um, Philip Deloria, I think is speaking, um, which I wish I could be there for, um, and about both the fascination of white people 
for a long time with, you know, quote unquote, playing Indian or, but not understanding the history. Um, and then there's some, some really good work that's been done more about Native communities. Um, I think Marge Bruchak has done a lot with communities more like around the um, Plymouth area. Um, and so um, I might be able to submit more of a, of a bibliography. But I think the other thing is, um, again, just that sense of the romanticized versions that um, people would have been familiar with. The one thing to, to say, and I haven't reread this novel in a long time, but Catherine Mariah Sedgwick, who was a really you know important novelist for them all, and of course, um, how I would have met, um, I've been so interested by her novel, Hope Leslie, I used to teach that with some frequency. And again, there was this, some romanticization going on, but at the same time, there were these figures within that um, from Native communities. Of course, it was set in the 17th century. You know, these women who were just phenomenally, um, you know, like the heroine you always wanted to be. It was like for me, I was thinking, yes, you know, write these these powerful women into these stories. And so um, it's been a while since I've read that. But I think there's also been some really good work in the Margaret Fuller scholarship community about Fuller and how she saw people when she visited the the area of the you know, what was her for her a very different place in the in the Great Lakes area um, in in her summer on the lakes. Um, so there's been some some promising work done there too. But it's work that is definitely ongoing. Um, yeah. So Sarah, you mentioned that um, you kind of talked a little bit about her marriage, but but not very much. So I wondered if you could go into that and and how did such a strong and independent woman fair in in her marriage it is very perplexing and unfortunately we just don't have that much of the written record from those periods um there does seem to have been a, a interesting conflict between Sturgis who did well she wasn't really you know what we would think of as sociable she really liked her private time she liked being by herself, she loved being in nature. Um, William apparently did not really like being that much with people at all. And so he had very little tolerance for social occasions. And apparently she had much more. Um, he really was more of the solitary type and, and even the laconic that I had mentioned Apparently, he was very to himself from what I from what I have gathered. Um, and so he also didn't really, and I think this was an interesting match for them at the beginning and then probably didn't work well, that um, both of them were looking for a vocation. And both of them, in an odd way, were um, affected by the fact that they have tremendously financially successful fathers. I mean, William's father was Lewis Tappan that some of us know because Tappan was active in anti-slavery. Um, but Tappan was also made a lot of money. Um, and so William tried to somehow work in an accounting office. And then he and another friend went off and tried to live in the woods. And it was a horrible failure. Um, and so William just never quite seemed to find a, something for him to do. And then it was like, well, maybe I can live in Lenox and I can have a kind of model farm idea that was popular for people at, at that time. And even that didn't seem to stick. And for Caroline, you know, she wanted some purposeful work as well. But it was, of course, for her, she had the gender thing going on there too. Like, what could she actually do? And as a woman of her class, that was also a strange it was sort of strange that that would actually, you know, that was such, held her back so much. If she had had less money, she might have been able to work more. And it's just a weird irony, I guess you would say, or it's like we can roll our eyes at. Um, and so they did take to living separately. Um, and because they had means, they could. And he pretty much stayed as much as he could in um, Lenox, um, loved the sort of very quiet life. And she would go back and forth and she had a much bigger house. It became part of the Tanglewood grounds. It's this big 
Tanglewood house. And then she would be at her sister's a lot of times and sometimes boarding elsewhere in Boston. Um, and, and then also went to Europe. She actually loved traveling. And partly the first trip to Europe was kind of in memory of Margaret Fuller. And when she was in mm -hmm. Europe that first time, it was only like five years after Fuller had died. And so she really went to all of the places that had been really important to Fuller. It was kind of a closure, I think, for for um, Sturgis at the times. But yeah, it was a, it was not a it was not a companionate marriage. No, no. So we have a question. Uh, could you talk more about your views of Emerson and Sturgis? One of the things I've really been interested in within the correspondence is that they both challenged each other. Um, and I really, the way that Sturgis would ask Emerson questions, and I didn't really go into this in, in talk tonight, but that she would call Emerson on his uh, falling short of you know thinking that he was this person who would always break boundaries. And then she would find him thinking conventionally. And she would challenge him on those ideas. Fourier, the, the French socialist, he, you know, she just would try to hold Emerson's feet to the fire to say, no, no, you need to keep reading. You need to read more closely. You need to think about this more deeply. You need to think further. But she would also do it with that kind of um, humor, if you will, to try to, they had an interesting humor going back and forth. Um, also, Sturgis's life in nature seemed to Emerson um, to really, uh, almost like he wished he could have that kind of freedom in nature. And it's interesting that he somehow didn't feel that. But when she was living in different places um, and he would write to her really wanting her nature descriptions. Um, the, I, I guess it's, I've, I've sometimes wondered like, well, what about for Sturgis? What did she gain out of that? Um, because sometimes it seems like it was kind of the sh like she didn't gain as much, right? You know, um, and so that still is kind of bemusing to me um, that it almost seems like, uh, you know, she did have someone to then try out her poetry on, try out some of her writings on, someone to write to and who would write back. Um, and also a sense of what was, interesting as the letters go along, and this goes into the 1850s, they both seemed really disappointed in human behavior most of the time, you know, that they would look at human beings and go like, oh, human beings, they're just always falling short, the God in ruins idea that no matter what human beings did, they just never lived up to it. And it seemed like the two of them could really share that, um, how do I say, almost disillusionment over human beings. And they have really interesting conversations over uh, illusion, what is illusion in this world and what is not illusory. Um, and again, Sturgis would challenge him um, about, don't call this elusive. Don't think this is illusion, you know, think further. And sometimes she would put those questions to him in poems, which I also think is a canny way of asking a question. That's great. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, they would like to hear more about the sisters, Caroline, Susan, and Ellen Sturgis, their relationship and Caroline's responses to the tragic deaths of her sisters. They all seem very creative in different ways. Yeah, and they definitely were. Um, and you know, Ellen was an amazing poet um, and, and really oftentimes was thought of perhaps as the quote unquote better poet than Caroline. Um, but it's probably better at finishing her poems than, than I think Caroline was. Um, and so the when Ellen died, and again, we don't have as much um, particular like media record, you know, that we have the the comment from Fuller after Ellen Sturgis's death about, you know, like there's like one of the most the brightest lights that we've just lost, um, paraphrase. And for El, for Sturgis, um, it was it was a it was a heartbreak. Although at the same time, um, certainly in some of the letters, I've detected a kind of um, friction. And reading some of Ellen's letters, Ellen really did go toward um, a kind of satire. Of, you know, you could see that Caroline also did, 
but there's a kind of, um, I don't know, a, a, a wittiness in Ellen's letters that sometimes is really at others' expense. And what's interesting is that Fuller really tried to rein Sturgis in to say, if you're going to use satire, make certain you're using it carefully. Don't do it just because it's fun to ridicule others. Make certain you're doing it for a point. And sometimes it seems like Ellen may have crossed the line that it was just, you know, she had the power so she could use it. Um, with Sue, again, that we don't have a particularly full record after Sue's death, but it was clear that one of the things that Sturgis tried to do with, you know, for Sue is just really stay engaged, stay in conversation. And there is a sense of, for Sturgis after Sue died, that she just misread her, that Sue also could take on this affect of just being witty and funny and self-ironizing. And somehow Sturgis felt like she missed it. Like Caroline felt that she missed what was hiding behind the way that Sue could just be so self-defacing and didn't understand what was actually going on behind that facade. And so that was one of the things that's a little bit of a heartbreak in one of the letters to Emerson that, yeah, that, yeah, what did she miss? Yeah. And there's a, a few more questions about um, this, this issue of the, the racist um, and derogatory sketches yeah and you know if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you get your head around that what i have gleaned from that notebook that's the it's in the smith college collections is that it was probably a notebook that she was keeping while she was um in this class and i assume again that it was probably a class that she was taking in in europe when she was there at some point could have could have been here, I suppose, in the United States, too. It might have been. Um, but it seems from a later period when she would have been in Europe. And the person teaching the class would have done this as an assignment for their students. And so you would have these racial types of, you know, kind of the stereotypical Italian or the stereotypical um, lower class person, you know, um, different working class your know, models, if you will, and they're labeled. And, and that also is just, you know, and it just seems like Sturgis was was doing what the teacher in the class had asked of her, because it seems like it's a, a sketchbook that was done for like a like a class that she was was taking at the time. And and so that's again, there's no um, you know, what I would obviously wish that she had done is like right in the margin, I, you know, like, like Emerson from one of his sermons at one point when he was delivering and he hadn't reread it and he was going like, I no longer believe what I just read. I, I wish that she had written in the margins, like going back to that book at one point saying, I don't agree with what these representations are, but she left no record about that. And so we don't really know what she intended to do with that. Um, you know, I think that as scholars, we're really still trying to reckon with how do we do this? We have to tell the whole story, obviously. You know, we can't just like leave it out. Um, and we have to talk about why and how to explain why they were so blind to some things and have pretty good vision with other things. Um, you know, she she talks about the United States in the 1850s. She talks about America as a country that is dead or almost dead, I think she uses the phrase, almost dead before it is born. And of course, that's the time after the fugitive slave law has been passed. It's the time when you know, people in the United States are just despairing over, can this country ever really go in the direction of justice? And so there were some things that she could see, and then other things that she just bought into. And, and of course, that's the same for all the transcendentalists. You, know, you can read some things that Emerson wrote that are so buying into a kind of um, hierarchy, whether it's within class or whether it's within race, and you think, wow, why didn't you also question that? And sometimes you would kind of almost almost get there, or thorough, you know, sometimes you go like, thorough, you just didn't quite get there with your understanding of your Native communities either. So, you know, I guess, you know, we just have to keep like pushing back at them. Um, 
but also being able to you know, tell the whole story um, and not apologize for them. You know. Very good. Uh, let's see. We've got quite a few questions here, but we're running out of time. Um, uh, I, well, there's a question about her uh, children's books. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, Caroline's children's books? She published two. Um, one was published right before she married. And her, Elizabeth Hoare actually said, so writing to Waldo um, Emerson saying, oh, this is like her parting gift to us because people were really not keen on the marriage when it actually happened. And so it's sort of interesting in itself. But the stories are fascinating. I have found them to be stories that in many ways are trying to envision certainly for children, but for the adults reading them too, a different way of organizing the world that is more um, collectively based. And so you have a lot of stories where the, you know, it's really focused on children helping each other. And if you do not help each other, you're not going to exist well in this world. And so I, I find that fascinating. She was not a person who joined Brook Farm, although she visited a bunch of times, and she was not a person, you know, kind of like Emerson and Fuller, who felt comfortable joining associations. But when she was imagining a future, she was thinking about a future in which people were collaborating, in which the only way that people actually would live well together would be if they weren't in it for themselves. And, um, I, I find that a pretty strong strand through most of the stories. The other thing that's interesting about those stories is that she didn't publish them under her own name. She didn't like, mm -hmm. and, I, and I find that also interesting, not I think necessarily like the thing like, oh, I'm a woman of a particular class. I can't have something published under my own name or I'm a woman, I'm not any of that. I think it may have been something about, you know, authorship didn't have to stick to a particular name that she did not want that kind of public um you know she wanted stories to just to be out there and to be read um, is there a particular title of a story you like oh um the the ones that are in this collection called rainbows for children i i think that was her first collection and there are many in there that are really again i think just delightful there's um and and they're very much located within the the understanding of how important it is to be surrounded by the natural world. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, I think for us today, that is a pretty potent comment too, you know, that, that, that you know, as not only as children, but for all of us, you know, we should be schooled first by nature. Wonderful. Well, for those of you who have some more questions and we can't get them get to them tonight, please contact uh, Sarah at Sarah S. Wider at Colgate.edu. Yeah, yeah. So please feel free to, to email me. I'm, I'm happy to continue this conversation um, via email and in, in whatever way we, we can. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been delightful. We really appreciate you coming. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hope to see you December 5th for our next event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye, Carol. Bye. Thank you.